This conversation with Catherine Blakespear is brought to you by Samuel Lawrence Foundation and the Coalition for Nuclear Safety. I'm Kathy Iwane, Secretary of the Coalition for Nuclear Safety, as well as a board member of Samuel Lawrence Foundation, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to share today's meeting rules, which you will also see on the screen. All participants will be muted during the presentation to avoid background noise. Uh, please enter your questions for Mayor Blakespear in the chat box. All questions may not receive a live response, but we will work with her to get responses to you at a later date. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on Samuel Lawrence's YouTube channel. Samuel Lawrence has worked on radioactive waste issues at San Onofre for the past 10 years, and quite extensively during COVID this last year and a half. To two years and intends to continue to advance the science and community work it takes to safeguard our coast from hazardous materials. It's my great pleasure today to welcome Mayor Blakespear to the second half of our coalition meeting today to join us in a conversation on nuclear waste at San Onofre. Uh, now our staff will mute, will unmute coalition members so that they could introduce their organization, their name, and the numbers represented. Hi, this is Charles Langley and Nina Baviars with Public Watchdogs. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, and our primary mission at this time is to find safe and effective ways to store the nuclear waste at San Onofre. We've also initiated multiple state and federal lawsuits to uh, essentially change the program, to change the way the waste is being stored. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi, my name is, uh, I'll turn, can you turn that? My name's uh, Bart Ziegler. And I'm a co-founder and, and the president of the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. And it's a privilege to be here with you, Mayor Blakespear, and deal with these issues. Our outreach is probably at least uh, 6,000 with our mailing list and plenty more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peter Anderson. I'm the immediate past chair of Sierra Club San Diego, representing 16,000 members and 35,000 supporters. And I'm also on the Sierra Club Nuclear Waste Task Force for the National Sierra Club, representing 3.5 million people. And I have extensive knowledge about nuclear waste. Thanks. Wonderful. Is Gary on the call? Yeah, hi. This is Gary Hedrick with San Clemente Green. We're an organization of about 5,000 people that were brought together through the, um, through the shutdown of, of San Onofre. And we've been following the whole issue ever since about how we're gonna deal with nuclear waste. And we really appreciate your attention to this matter. Fantastic. With that, it's my honor to introduce Solana Beach Mayor Lisa Hebner, who has served three terms on the council three terms as mayor, her councils enacted San Diego's first single-use plastic ban, um, as well as its first community energy choice program. Lisa is a UCSD graduate and served 10 years as primary board member on SANDAG. Uh, she, outside of her time as a public servant, she successfully developed uh, a culinary business featuring her talents as author, TV chef, and nationally known kitchen designer. Wow. Mayor Hebner, would you do us the honor of introducing Mayor Blake Blakespear? Uh, I would very much be thrilled and happy to do that. It is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Catherine Blakespear. I've known Catherine for quite a while, and I know that she's a fourth generation Encinitan whose great grandparents put roots down in the area nearly 100 years ago. I personally know that she comes from a long line of very strong, capable, bright, and creative women. After earning her bachelor's and master's degrees in journalism from Northwestern and her law degree from the University of Utah, Catherine returned to Encinitas to practice law and volunteer in her community. She was elected to the council in 2014, then elected mayor in 2016, and re-elected in 2018 and again in 2020, winning by double-digit margins in all three citywide races. 
she can run a good race. In December of last year, she was unanimously chosen in a bipartisan vote to be the chair of SANDAG, which is our county's transportation agency. And as a fellow board member of SANDAG, I can tell you that this is an organization whose members span the political spectrum and so is fertile ground for a lot of disagreements. Yet in running those meetings, Catherine is an excellent communicator, able to discern the crux of an issue at first blush and work toward resolution in a firm yet agreeable and non-confrontational manner. Mayor Blake Spear is now running for the California State Senate in District 36, which spans all the way from Encinitas to South Orange County. Please welcome Mayor Catherine Blake Spear. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, Mayor Huebner. I love serving with Mayor Huebner as uh, my neighboring mayor to the south in Solana Beach and on the Sand Egg Board. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to introduce me today. And thank you to everybody who has come um, and is working on the issue of nuclear safety and particularly focused on San Onofre, um, who's on this call. Some of you I know from the Sierra Club and other advocacy. Um, and so I just wanna say, you know, thank you for all the work that you do, because I do believe that it, truthfully leadership leaders come from standing on the shoulders of people like you, activists who want change. And so the fact that you are talking about this and inviting your elected officials to speak and, and really think about and address the issue is the way that we do see change. Um, so so I'm, I'm happy to just uh, speak a little bit and then I will open it up to questions. Is that how you'd like to do it, Kathy? Um, actually, if you don't mind, we'd like to um, give you that time just a little bit later in the presentation. Is that okay? And then, and then we'll hopefully get through that quickly so we allow more time for Q&A. Does that, okay. is that agreeable? Of course, however, yeah. Fantastic, cool. fantastic. Thank you, very good, wonderful. Next, we have Alice McNally, who's a superpower in our coalition to tell us a bit about what we do. Alice? Alice, you're muted. Thank you for that. Welcome, Mayor Blake Spear, Mayor Hebler, and guests. I would like to acquaint you with our CNS mission, focus, and goals. As a 20 plus member strong group of regional scientists, environmentalists, and community members, the Coalition for Nuclear Safety advocates for the safest storage of nuclear waste at San Onofre and beyond. The clear and present danger of radioactive waste is an issue of climate injustice and poses intergenerational harm for centuries to come. As a coalition, our vision is of a California that is free from this waste created by nuclear power with proven and certified containment for all existing waste, ensuring protection of the environment, economy, and our way of life. Our nuclear goals, our secure public monitoring of radioactive emissions require construction of a handling facility, i.e. hot cell, transfer radioactive waste to thick walled transportable casts, identify permanent storage site with the scientific integrity to last, improve our transportation infrastructure, we are committed to protecting our community and environment from harmful radioactive waste stored at San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station and across the nation. Please join us. Thank you, Ali. That was wonderful. Now I'd like to take uh, a moment to explain the actual issues we face with this waste buried at the beach and also to explain Samuel Lawrence Foundation's California Coastal Commission lawsuit. To protect our coast, the Samuel Lawrence Foundation is taking the California Coastal Commission to court. The powerful state agency should not have approved Southern California Edison's application to deconstruct the San Onofre nuclear generating station. We are asked the court to overturn that approval. The Coalition for Nuclear Safety supports this lawsuit, aiming for safe decommissioning and securing the nuclear waste until it can be moved. In the words of our coalition member, City of Laguna Woods, Mayor Sherry Horn, quote, all I am sure of is I want the waste moved ASAP to consent-based siting, and I want to have it safe as long as it is here, unquote. 
Indeed, a legal victory would set a precedent to ensure safe decommissioning across our country in the United States at all nuclear power plants and waste sites. The Coastal Commission would be forced to withdraw the coastal development permit that allows Edison to destroy the spent fuel pools, for which now are the only working uh, facility to handle the stranded waste at San Onofre. So what are the problems facing us at San Onofre? We have 6.3 million pounds of high burn up nuclear fuel stranded at San Onofre Beach in thin walled Holtec canisters only warranted for 25 years. With a defective loading system that has scratched and gouged these canisters, hastening the corrosion on them due to the marine layer environment. The waste is buried 100 feet away from the ocean, away from the water, only one foot above our naturally occurring water tables. In other words, our drinking water. Historically, we know that the waste is stranded in the precise area once entitled Earthquake Bay, seen on this map from 1881. The waste sits on an intersection of three fault lines and located in a tsunami inundation zone. There are geologic mineral markers proving the history of tsunami inland from San Onofre. And this is a, a map showing you that. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission called the NRC is our federal regulator. They um, have allowed Southern Cal Edison, which is the utility managing this waste um, to end all offsite emergency planning for a nuclear emergency. The NRC nor Edison will answer our questions about outlier events. What are outlier events? Big earthquakes, tsunami, terrorism, and cyber terrorism, because they classify these events as non credible or unlikely. Edison has no plan B in case of an outlier event. There's no proven repair method for canisters. Edison says they will use a nickel alloy spray paint to repair this, these canisters. This repair method has never been used in the industry, nor has it been approved by the NRC. Okay, so what is our lawsuit asking for? The first overarching claim is about their, the California Coastal Commission's mission and their, um, their statement of um, credence. In 2017, when the commission gave permits to Edison to bury the nuclear waste on the beach, and again in July, 2020, when the commission unanimous, unanimously okayed Edison's inspection and maintenance plan to continue decommissioning all visible structures there, they went against the Coastal Act. This is the very ruling that gives the commission its purpose and mission, including to protect and enhance California's coast. Second, our lawsuit seeks retaining the spent fuel pools until a dry transfer facility, otherwise known as a hot cell, can be safely built to repackage this waste into thick walled casts. These thick walled casts are used all over the world. They're good for a hundred years and they can safely be transported off site to higher ground. Finally, though our lawsuit doesn't call for it, the Coalition for Nuclear Safety calls for state-of-the-art off-site radiation monitoring to act as a check and balance to Edison's rudimentary monitoring, which is only on site. This technology is up and running through UCSD. It was the first system to confirm Fukushima radiation in 2011 on the West Coast. While we wait, we await Judge Beckloff's final ruling expected 90 days from June 16th. Now I'd like to invite Mayor Blake Spear to share her thoughts and ideas on the issues discussed thus far. Okay, well, that was <laughs> that was a um, a really uh, sobering and an interesting summary of the situation. 
So I, I appreciate you sharing that with me and with everybody. And I know all of you probably saw this um, in the newspaper this morning, wait, can you see it? It's in the business section and it's, the headline is county joins move to push San Onofre waste remote removal. So I think this is, this is another uh, brewing controversy about where is time and energy being spent um, and the, the county board of supervisors. Um, I think your organization is um, opposed to this this uh, move here to get more involved with Edison um, and spend $100,000 on that. Um, so, so I'll just give a couple of, of my thoughts on, on a number of these different things based on the information that's available to me and that I've uh, researched. So, so we all know that this is an imminent threat, right? 1,600 tons of spent nuclear fuel near active earthquake fault lines, like you said, risks of terrorism, tsunamis, there are more than 9 million people living nearby. Um, and the federal government has not constructed a repository to send this spent fuel from our site or from 121 other nuclear sites in 35 states. So, you know, the scope of this risk and this problem is, is just tremendously large. Um, but, but our main focus is this, this one that's right next to us. And I think in addition, we are in the big picture, we're quite fearful that we're not being adequately protected. So recognizing that it is here right now, um, we need to have procedures in place and we need to feel that the population is being protected for our public health and safety as a top priority. And I think uh, in, in uh, I listened to an interview that our Congressman Mike Levin had done with um, Greg Jacksko, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Jacksko, and he's the former chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And one of the things that he said that I thought was a really important point is he was talking about how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission needs to have board members whose top priority and mission is about protecting public health and safety, not about prioritizing the nuclear power industry. And so, you know, that the, the, the idea that at the federal level, the oversight boards are focusing or have um, a, a, an orientation toward prioritizing the nuclear power industry over health and safety, you know, that's, that's problematic and troubling and we should be working on that as well because I do think that leadership and the focus from these federal agencies is really critically important in determining what happens. Um, and so, you know, we know that at the end of the day, what we all want is to move this uh, off of our coastline. But as your organization has pointed out in the letter um, that you had sent out to elected officials, there's a real, very serious concern about interim storage sites. And what's um, a term that I like is nuclear colonialism. So like the idea of sending this waste to communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, communities that aren't, aren't able to mount an adequate defense. And then, you know, the environmental racism that comes from that, you know, these are all just like very substantial concerns, but we also know that we need to have a different place for it. And so um, what, what is that place gonna be and who is gonna raise their hand in a consensus-based system to say yes, um, and of course it will be because of financial benefits. And I think one of the things I've heard repeated a number of times is that, that some of the interim op options are only appealing if there's a long-term site being worked on. So, you know, that that needs, we need to be focused on both interim and long-term or just long-term. Um, and then as um, Samuel Lawrence Foundation has advocated for, you know, some of the shorter term things that need to protect health and safety are really important. And I completely agree with this. So there's no question that we need to have a state of the art radiation and leak detection monitoring systems and ways to, 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 to predict what is happening and also to know right away what is happening. And then to have a process for what we would do in the event of that. And we also need to make sure the canisters are as safe as possible. So having high quality canisters that are transportable seems to be a top priority as well. And that's certainly within our control. I, I mean, societally, we don't have, it seems like, like these 54 ton thin walled steel canisters that are loaded with nuclear waste, we really need everybody to, to uh, apply the best minds to figure out how to make these canisters as safe as possible. And, and some of the, the details around 
when they bang when they're being put in and they bang into these rings and then the scratches open up new fissures you know these are things that are dealt with all the time like on our bridges that that cars drive on and and all of the major heavy infrastructure we're doing in this state in this county at this moment you know there's a lot of technology around how what is the best practice to protect things that are encased in concrete and encased in steel and on other materials so so it seems like having sensors that detect damage, requiring that the canisters are um, at the highest possible quality um, to remove those hazards and risks. In some ways, that seems like the, the simplest, like it seems like that that is the low hanging fruit that needs to, to be addressed right away. Um, and I heard um, one of the things that, that I heard on this interview with Greg Jacksco was the suggestion that the canisters be subjected to an actual fire because a fire is the real risk. So it's like, let's put these canisters in a fire or start a fire around them and see what happens to them. Instead of relying on simulations and computer models, you know, which you do those things when you can't actually do a real test, but, but we can. So, you know, so advocating for that, I think is really important. I mean, at the end of the day, what I see happening in this whole area is that there are a lot of challenges on every side. So we have a lot of dispute about the technical side we have a lot of disputes in the political side. We have a community and organizational challenges in terms of working at cross purposes and not being aligned in what's the best and most important thing to do. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, I go back to my experience. So I'll have been in local elected office for eight years and um, six as mayor, two on city council. And my experience is that a lot of analysis paralysis can set in when there are a lot of goals and there is a lack of consensus about what is the top priority or the critical path. So I think, you know, this, the dispute over, I think it's a legitimate point that interim storage the, is not being, the interim storage sites are not being designed to meet, to be permanent. And so that me, makes it so that they're not as safe. And I think it's important that any interim sites you do are are designed in such a way that they could that they that they meet the highest safety standards but i think it's also it's going to become important that the political leadership and the advocacy groups can get on the same page about how is it that we're going to get to moving this stuff so so because those things when those are all working across purposes in order to actually have a breakthrough and find a solution you at least my experience in government is that you have to go back to saying like, what is the core goal here? And sometimes you can have this mission creep where the goal can become everything. And I see this in transportation projects where the goal of a transportation project becomes stormwater management. And you're, and it's like, wait, is that, I, I mean, so we wanna solve every problem as long as we're doing something, but, but what is the most important problem to solve? Um, and so, you know, I think it's great that, that Congressman Levin is showing such leadership in this area. Um, and, and forming this caucus uh, at the congressional level, because ultimately it is, that is a reflection of leadership. Like we have in some ways had a failure of leadership. And this happens on a lot of intractable problems where the solutions are very difficult and unclear. There's a lot of dispute about on the technical side. And so you just end up with no action. And you see that that's what's happened in this realm. So, so I, I'm happy to see that he's so heavily engaged in this and you will notice that that's a really quite a difference from Congressman Issa who preceded him in this position and you know, didn't spend anywhere near as much energy or time on this topic. Um, and so, yeah, that leadership at the top really does matter. Um, but, but so I guess, you know, figuring out how to have a process that might create the possibility for a different site in this country or some type of a um, disposition of the spent nuclear fuel that's that's different than just burying it because I know that there's been this focus on a like a, a deep single geologic repository so where would that be and and that there are other, but there are other things that are talked about, like reprocessing of the waste, or is, is it more of a scattered site approach where like you have multiple places that take smaller amounts of it, which might be more, which might be more possible. Um, but at the end, you know, you end up with saying, okay, well, what, what are we doing with our, our, the, our waste that's from this site and, and what is possible and on the table. So, so, you know, I think that, I think it is important that 
that there be active leadership and that the community groups align and that we're able to move towards something that is that critical path forward. So I guess those are my thoughts. <laughs> and Fantastic. and I, I think of this as a really critically important issue. And every time I dive into this topic, it's direness strikes me because it's just like, it's so catastrophic. And, and in the biggest picture, you go to these questions of like, is climate change more of a threat because we'll make the planet inhabitable or having something like this go wrong and the, num the amount of suffering and the, and the incredible environmental degradation that would come from that. I mean, it's just staggering. And so, you know, these are, these are things that, that I think about. Thank you very much, Mayor Blake Spear, for your input. Before we go and on to Q and A with the with our coalition today and you, I'd like to take a second to introduce Peter Anderson. He um, who is a former he's a member of our coalition, and he's a, a former communications professor at San Diego State, thirty years, uh, author of two hundred and forty publications, textbooks, member of the Nuclear Waste Task Force for Sierra Club and heading up so many environmental issues for the San Diego Sierra Club. Peter, can you um, suggest steps elected officials can take regarding this? I sure can, and I'll try to be brief because we want to get to the Q&A. Uh, we started out by talking about five goals. Remember, none of those have been achieved. So let's just talk about the two goals. Uh, right now, we need to retain a cooling pool. Right now, if something catastrophic happens to a chaos, there is nothing we can do. So if there was an empty cooling pool, which was there and I think is still intact, a chaos can be moved to that cooling pool. Now, we sp I spent uh, two and a half years, an hour and a half a week on this nuclear waste task force for Sierra Club. And that's one of our recommendations is leaving cooling pools or getting a hot cell in place. So that's number one thing that you folks should be advocating for. Number two is you should advocate for improved monitoring. Now the Dean of the College of Science at, at UCSD, our local world-class university has a method of doing this and has been doing it. But we need a couple hundred thousand dollars for uh, a full-time person to bring the stuff from the air pollution control district that can monitor whether there is a, a catastrophic spread of nuclear waste out of the San Onofre site. Right now, we have no capability of doing that. So what can you do? First of all, pass a resolution recommending these two things in your own city council. Number two, you can ask the county to finance this better monitoring at San Onofre. Number three, you can ask the governor, the coastal commission and the state legislature at the state level to get with it and do the minimal protections for 9 million local residents of this area. And finally, you can support Mike Levin and the folks at the uh, federal level to get a permanent repository. Uh, reprocessing is a disaster. That's what the nuclear industry wants because they can, so they can make more advanced nuclear uh, reactors. And that's what would happen with reprocessing. We have to have a permanent repository those temporary repositories will be uh, permanent if, if we allow that to happen. There could be an interim solution to just move it five miles into Camp Pendleton. At least it's not by the Pacific Ocean, tsunamis, terrorists, and Interstate 5. So uh, those are my recommendations. Uh, they're on behalf of the, <clears throat> the coalition, and uh, we look forward to uh, you continue to help us out with this uh, very intractable problem. Thank you, Peter. May I uh, make a suggestion for today's Zoom call? We have uh, a couple questions already in, in the queue to ask, and this is the most important part of our um, presentation. Can we all agree on this call to extend at least 15 minutes more because we really would like to have this Q&A engagement? Is that agreeable with everyone because it is now 12? Maybe we could get a show of, show of hands. Um, with that, I have a reminder to our audience to put questions for Mayor Blake Spear in the chat box, please. We have a couple starting. I'd like to start our Q&A session off by unmuting Mayor Hebner's mic and allowing her to ask the first question, please. Sure. Um, 
Catherine, given that we're both on Sandag and where we see this located right near the Low Sand Corridor and the I-5, do you see any role that Sandag could play um, in advocating or even providing funds for studies? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, the Sandag is one of the most important agencies in the county. It has um, all of the mayors and uh, board of supervisors and some council members on it. So it represents all 18 cities in the county. And I think that when you look at what Sandag has gotten involved in that's outside of the very narrow transportation area, it's regional planning and it's climate action planning. Um, and something like, like this could be something that Sandag would look at. I know, I, you know, it would certainly be a process, I think, to get other cities engaged in this topic, um, especially ones that are just farther away in the South Bay. And um, I think engagement, you know, goes down the farther you get from it. And, uh, but I think it's worth thinking about. It's a good, it's a good idea. I was thinking perhaps some presentation either to regional planning or transportation given uh, those two locations, you know, the you know, major, major corridors might get it started. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, our first, great. Thank you very much. Our first question from the coalition and Mayor Blakespear has done uh, a job of already uh, um, attending to part of this question. Mayor Blakespear, when elected to Senate, how do you plan to prioritize the safety and, nu and uh, security of the nuclear waste here at San Onofre? Well, the state has oversight over the Coastal Commission. And you, you know, you're in a lawsuit with the Coastal Commission and making sure that they are um, applying the proper analysis to this tremendous safety hazard, I think is something that's really important. Um, and yeah, the, Coast, the Coastal Commission is created at the state level. So who serves on it and, and what, how do they prioritize and work on things and what is the analytic framework? I think that's really important. Um, I think there's also the possibility of something similar to what's happening at the federal level. So like a, a state level caucus of um, different assembly members and senators and representatives from the governor's office. So all three of the branches mm. to, um, they're not branches, but all, all three of those prongs to evaluate what more could be done and to come up with solutions and build coalitions and and ultimately help create that path forward. Because you know, every time I participate in a discussion about this, there's a, um, a, a, a different idea, a good idea, a rejection of an idea. And some of that, all of that is great because it's this fomenting of potential solutions. But at some point, you, know, you need to gather all that up and then decide on a path. And so you know, that has to happen by people who are in elected uh, office and le leadership positions at, at regulatory agencies and at the federal and at the state level. Thank you. The second question from the coalition today, are you aware that by Southern California Edison's own admission, all 73 uh, cans, canisters, buried um, at San Onofre are scratched and gouged during their um, whole tech downloading process? This damage may indeed circumvent any physical movement out of our region. What's your yeah. response? I mean, I think that like many of these technical discussions, there's the there are these different positions. Like uh, you know, they'll they say that it's barely a scratch, that it doesn't matter, that this is inconsequential, um, and that that it is sustainable and suitable and adequate and meets all the standards. You know, it, I think that having it be at the highest level of public safety and a commitment to that from Edison is what we should expect. And we should, we should hold them to that. I, I mean, I think it is possible for advocates and the regulatory agency and Edison to agree on, on that highest level. Like to say, you know, this is the standard of care, and this is what we expect, and then to have it be be more than what is currently currently happening. And and I, I mean, there are, like I said before, like with transportation projects, we build huge bridges. Like we're building one at the San Alejo Lagoon right now. This massive bridge with these big bores that go into the ground by hundreds of feet, yards down, and there's not a lot of dispute or discussion about whether that's safe or not. 
you know, it's carrying thousands of people and goods and, and nobody is saying this is not safely designed. So, you know, I think looking to say there are standards and there is a higher commitment that we can make to safety and then and basically having that resolved. I think that that's a really good idea and that, that, that really needs to happen. And, and ultimately, I mean, Edison's going to have to do it. So, because unless control is taken away from them, but, but they're the, the primary owner. So, so ultimately, I mean, there is going to have to be a working with them or forcing them into it through either lawsuits or regulatory requirements in order to get that to happen. Thank you. The next question, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors just voted to spend $100,000 dollars of taxpayer funds to build Edison's Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now Coalition, simply a new name and new branding. Edison installed four $1,800 Geiger counters on site and then billed the public $300,000. Would public funds be better spent on public safety for those living near the nuclear waste dump? UCSD has developed the sensitive and state-of-the-art radiation monitoring. How do you feel Edison ought to spend public funds? Should Edison be spending public funds? That's a loaded yeah. question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much complexity in that question. I, I mean, truthfully, I think it's an all of the above answer. I think Edison, I think $100,000 is, is a token commitment. It, it, it's good to have the county board of supervisors engaged in this topic at all. So um, having them participate, uh, I mean, ultimately government agencies and, and Edison are going to have, they are going to have to work together. So having them be figuring out a path forward that's focused on safety, I think is important. Would, would that money be better spent in a different way? It, I think we need to spend money on the different things that you've advocated for. So all of the um, mo the monitoring and the the uh, early warning <laughs> systems and detection of leaks and all that kind of all of those things are just really critically important. Um, but yeah, so I guess I would say I think more needs to be done in general, and it needs to be done in collaboration with them, but also outside of them. Thank you. Uh, the next question, can we try to get a bill passed that addresses handling nuclear waste in different containers than have been dictated by Holtec, um, a private company which has no right to operate as a federal waste management agency without extreme scrutiny, not just by the NRC, but by the people of the U.S. as represented by our elected officials? Uh, I mean... That's certainly possible. I, I think, like I said, the quality of the canisters and making them transportable is the very top of mind, most important thing. So the, the, the canisters need to be held to that higher standard. And I think we, there's no question from when I hear about, I mean, I'm not a technical person, you know, I'm a lawyer by training and I, I've been um, in elected office. And so, so you do rely on these other experts to say, and I know that when we had, like, for example, one of our, Cal the bridges, a Caltrans bridge in our city had someone put up a gorilla piece of art where they like banged into the concrete. And the idea, the, the statement of why that was unacceptable and needed to come down was that it was creating a fissure that water would get in and it would slowly over time make its way and it would crack eventually over time this, the bridge. And so, you know, the, the art was removed and that fissure was filled and everybody uh, evaluated it and said it's fine. Um, but, but that is, if it had gone deeper, it would have created a, a bigger problem. So the question is, with these new scratches, what kind of fissures were opened up and how thick is it and does it need, you know, all of that is a technical question that does need to be answered by experts. But I think potentially it is a big issue and it's really important that these, um, that there be um, sensors to detect if there's damage because we need the canisters to be safe. And we, it would really just be totally unacceptable if we, we overlooked it or were sloppy and in some ways did have something happen here. So there, there are serious hazards and we need to take that very seriously. I think that's one of the reasons that Edison has lost the confidence of so many people is that they seem to be minimizing the risk. And, you know, they would help themselves and all of the government agencies working with them would help, would help restore that confidence by taking these risks and hazards very, very seriously. Next question. Our federal re regulator, the NRC, will not let California or any state 
make judgments or rulings con concerning safety of nuclear issues they are in control of. How do you plan to get around this legal blockade when elected to state Senate? Well, I think working with our federal partners like Congressman Levin and following the advice of Greg Jasko about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission having people appointed to it who are prioritizing the protection of public health and safety instead of the nuclear power industry. You know, to me, it, those are all the different ways that we can we can help change that narrative and that picture and the reality. You know, I think just like on other issues like border protection or border control, what is the state's role when it comes to what's considered a federal issue? You know, there's a lot of, there's friction, there's overlap, there's working together, there's working apart, you know, and we, yeah, it's an area that we need to be jumping into and, and really working with federal partners to try to make it work for us. Very good. Though, let's see, through wall stress corrosion cracking, through wall stress corrosion cracking is always initiated by a scratch, dent, or other damage to stainless steel. I think this was touched on in your uh, comments earlier. However, if you can add to, are any, are you aware that every can is scratched at San Onofre? Yeah, I mean, I think you asked that question. And I guess it comes, like I said, I mean, the integrity of the canisters is, is most important. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I knew they were all scratch. Uh, I think that, like I said, Edison says that these scratches are minimal and, and not a safety risk, but, but we need to make sure that they aren't. And that's why we need sensors. We should do tests on them and put them in a fire. I think that's a great idea and mm -hmm. make sure that they perform based on reality, not based on simulations and computer models only. Cause we have the ability to do that with these canisters. Everyone, the next question, everyone knows corrosion of metal is sustainable. Ought Edison begin to study their metal container corrosion problem? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I support that. <laughs> <laughs> next question. Are you aware that Edison, almost immediately after the radiation leak that closed the plant in 2012, filed for and secured massive emergency planning response exemptions? Additionally, that immediately before the bur burial of these canisters began, Edison also secured on-site and off-site insurance exemptions. I was not aware of that. I do think that insurance policies drive actions and it's worrying to hear that they might have an exemption. I mean, that's the entire point of insurance <laughs> is like that if something happens that they would need to be on the hook and there that's why you buy insurance is to protect against a risk that something would happen so so um yeah you you, you need you want someone to be on the hook uh, i mean if a canister breaks or or you know whatever thing happens uh, i yeah i was not aware of that i i think pr pushing edison to be as safe as possible to have processes and policies and regulations in place that protect public health and safety, that's the main goal. It needs to be focused on at, at all times. Um, so, you know, getting, getting to that place is where we need to be. Okay, next question. Uh, Mayor Blakespear, will your fine city endorse the SLF suit against the Coastal Commission? Oh. We wish to... We wish to ensure the spent fuel pools be saved in case of emergency or catastrophe. Edison wishes to remove the tombstones and spent fuel pools, leaving nothing in event of an emergency or catastrophe. However, the unvisible structures is the point of today's conversation. Um, it will remain probably for most of our lifetimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to consider that, to bring it into um, uh, an analysis framework, you know, for the city and send, send it to me. And, um, I, 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 I'm happy to give it serious consideration. I, I don't make individual decisions. You know, there are five of us who do that. So I would need to bring it to the city council, but, um, and, and of course, you know, have it be evaluated, uh, against other statements and positions like from our assembly member and our congressman and, to see where where this sits. I don't immediately know that in my mm -hmm. mind, but it seems like a great idea. 
because because it's basically a safeguard. I mean, it's like, you, you know, let's not take out, I heard what Peter Anderson said in his comments, uh, you know, let's not take out this, this uh, last protection against something really bad happening. Uh, so it does seem like a great, a really an important thing to do. Fantastic. Well, we really, uh, for the moment, we have no questions. We are 15 minutes over time. So what I would like to do is thank you so very much for, um, thank you, Catherine, this was great. How does our community feel? Should we host more of these conversations? And most importantly, the, co the Coalition for Nuclear Safety extends uh, their gratitude to both you, Catherine, and you, Lisa, for making yourselves uh, available to us today and sharing your ideas with us. Thanks also to SLF staff and the coalition for their collaborative efforts to put this forum on. And to our participants, thank you for your support, your questions, and for joining us today. We have given everybody the ability to unmute. Um, so now you're able to share your words of gratitude and a round of applause for a fruitful discussion. Thank you so much, Mayor. And yes. Good luck. Thank good you. Luck. Yeah, good luck. Thank we you. need you. You got my vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your interest and your commitment. Keep it up. We're voting Thank for you. Lisa. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, you guys. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thanks, everyone.